This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Captivology, The Science of Capturing People's Attention by Ben Parr. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 2 The Automaticity Trigger Ophrys apifera, like many flowering plants, pollinates by attracting insects and hoping that those insects spread its pollen, a process called entomophily. Better known as the bee orchid, Ophrys apifera is unique because it relies on the assistance of just one species, the longhorned bee, to spread its pollen for reproduction. Flowering plants must find many ways to attract bees, wasps, and other insects to their pollen. Most use bright colors to advertise that they have nectar, an important food for most insects. But the bee orchid uses a more thorough tactic to attract the longhorn bees. The center of the orchid's flower, between, between its beautiful pink lavender petals, hosts a furry protrusion that has the color, shape, smell, and even texture of a bee. More specifically, a female bee. By mimicking the pheromones of the female bee, the bee orchid attracts eager ba male bees in order to convince them to land and attempt to mate with their flower. The short, furry, and smooth hairs running along the flower's protrusion further signals to the male bee that it has found a willing female bee. Once the bee has attempted to do its business, or, had or has figured out that the female bee isn't a bee at all, it flies off to another bee orchid and spreads the pollen. The bee orchid uses this tactic, pseudocopulation, in order to trick bees into mating with it. In fact, the entire genus of Ophrys is incredibly adept at pseudocopulation to spread its pollen. The bumblebee orchid's protrusion is darker and fatter. The fly orchid is thinner and has what looks like wings. The early spider orchid is a darker brown and contains distinctive markings that make it look like an arachnid. Each one has found a way to use sensory cues to attract an insect of its choice. All plants and animals, humans included, rely on sensory cues for focusing, directing, and misdirecting attention. Fireflies rely on bioluminescence to attract potential mates, while the bright yellow of a wasp is an instantaneous warning for us to back away and keep our distance. The leaf insect perfectly, purposely shuns attention by hiding in plain sight. Some even have frayed edges that look like bite marks. When it comes to fooling predators, the details can mean the difference between life and death. While we humans don't use illuminating rears to attract males or bright colors to ward off predators, we rely heavily on sensory cues hardwired into our brain to help us direct attention. More often than not, this happens unconsciously and in unexpected ways. Men will sit closer to a woman and ask more intimate questions solely because she is wearing the color red. And if you want people to better taste the sweetness of a drink, all you have to do is drop some green food coloring in it. What's happening? How does something as simple as color or shape influence the way we pay attention? This is the automaticity trigger. If I were to show you a picture of a lion and a picture of an antelope, which one would you pay more attention to? In fact, this is just what Jessica Yorzinski and her collaborators at Duke University and UC Davis tested. They tracked the eye movements of subject as they looked at sets of images. One set had lions and antelope, another had snakes and lizards. Subjects were asked to identify a target animal in a 3x3 three three square array of images. They included one target animal and seven distractors. The middle box was left empty. So it looks something like this. The result, Yorzinski and her team found that the subjects not only located dangerous animals faster, but also that their gaze lasted longer on the lions and snakes, even when they were asked to search for antelopes and lizards. They, their attention automatically focused on potential threats and ignored everything else. This is how our brain is programmed. We ignore everything that isn't necessary to our goals, because if we didn't, we'd quickly succumb to directed attention fatigue, DAF, a phenomenon that occurs with exposure to too many stimuli. When people experience DAF, they start feeling mentally fatigued, are more distracted, make more mistakes, and are generally more irritable. Imagine if everything you saw, felt, or touched was processed by your consciousness, morning and night, with no capability to focus or concentrate. 
Yeah, you'd go insane. That's why we, we rely on salient sensory cues to warn us of danger and alert us to new situations that require attention. Our brain is always looking for these sensory cues, colors, movements, sounds, textures, smells, and other sensations to help us figure out what we need to pay attention to throughout the day. Not all cues are made equal though. A man wearing a black suit in a crowd will be far less effective at generating attention than a man wearing a red suit. We have a tendency to shift our attention toward cues that stick out from the crowd. Is that rustling in the brush just the wind, or is it a predator pre preparing to pounce? We need to be aware of disturbances in our environment so that we can investigate and decide if we need to fight, flee, or go back to our daily business. At its core, looking for cues that stand out is a survival mechanism. As a result, we are more likely to remember isolated or unique sensory cues. This is known as the von Restorff effect, named after phys psychiatrist and pediatrician Hedwig von Restorff. The following is a list of foods. I want you to take 20 seconds and attempt to memorize these words, then write down as many of you can on a piece of paper. It's incredibly difficult for most people to remember a list of items this long, especially if they're only given 20 seconds. But I bet two items made your list. Mango and Mary Poppins. Why? Because isolated items, or things that stand out, are much more likely to be encoded to memory. In this case, Mango stands out visually and Mary Poppins stands out contextually. It doesn't really belong on the list. In a world where we must function with scarce working memory, instinctive cues are often the first thing that our attention encounters. This is where the first cap captivation trigger comes into play. The automaticity trigger is our unconscious tendency to shift attention toward the sights, sounds, and other sensory cues which are important to our survival. The bright yellow of a nest of wasps or the loud bang of a gunshot activates our attention automatically because we need to respond quickly to potential threats and opportunities. The automaticity trigger is what sparks the first stage of attention, immediate attention. It's the jolt that forces people to turn their attention toward you. Because of that, it is essential to harness the power of this trigger if you want to start capturing attention for your ideas or products. The automaticity trigger can capture our attention in two distinct ways. The first is through contrast, when a sensory cue captures our attention because it simply stands out. Contrast is, for example, why mango stands out from the list from earlier. The word visually contrasts with its environment. Contrast is the reason why our eyes are naturally attracted to a flashlight in the darkness, and why a loud boom on a quiet afternoon diverts our attention. The second way the automaticity trigger captures our attention is through association. When a sensory cue draws our immediate attention because of a mental association, or lack thereof, we have with that cue. Mary Poppins stands out on our previous list because we don't associate that term with foods, and thus it sticks out like a sore thumb. A wasp's yellow, or the deep crimson of blood, activates our attention because we know both colors are associated with danger at a subconscious level. Throughout the rest of this chapter, we will explore how the automaticity trigger works and how you can leverage it by appealing to key aspects of your audience's senses, especially sight, hearing, and touch. To do that, we need to first explore the most powerful visual sensory cue of them all, color. What is the color of attention? You're hiking through the forest when unexpectedly you fall into a small river and lose your cell phone. You need it. That's how you were going to get your ride home. You were far away from where you started, so you make your way to a nearby road. Now you need to wave a car down to make a phone call before it gets dark. What color shirt should you wear if you want someone to pull over? Does it even matter? In a study published in Color Research and Application, French professor Dr. Nicolas Jujuin asked five women in their early 20s to pose as hitchhikers and attempt to get unsuspecting drivers to stop and pick them up. The key variable? The color of the t-shirt which each woman wore. Guggen and his team tested black, white, red, blue, green, and yellow to see if any color had a discernible advantage on the attention of drivers. The results were fascinating. 
female drivers noticed and stopped for a female hitchhiker almost 10% of the time if the hitchhiker wore a yellow shirt and 9% for the red shirt. But a hitchhiker wearing a green shirt would, would only get stops 5.28% of the time. Black shirts, 5.9%, didn't fare much better. Blue was 6.69%, nice, and white was 7.12%. More interesting, though, was how male drivers responded to the female hitchhikers. No surprises. Red was in a league of its own. 20.77% of male drivers, one in five, stopped to pick up a female hitchhiker in a red shirt. Yellow, at 14.89%, was only marginally higher than blue, at 14.11%, and white, at 13.98%, while black and green once again performed the worst. Gu Yuan's study perfectly demonstrates the two elements of the automaticity trigger, contrast and association. When female hitchhikers tried to get the attention of female drivers, the reason that those drivers pulled over seemed to be about contrast. Red and yellow simply pop out visually when you place them against the backdrop of gray roads. On the other hand, contrast didn't seem to play much of a role when it came to female hitchhikers capturing the attention of male drivers. No surprise there. In the latter case, the unconscious association the male drivers had between romance and the color red likely kicked in, drawing their eye almost automatically. The color red is perfectly adept at capturing attention in romantic situations. Another study conducted by Dr. Andrew Elliott at the University of Rochester found that simply placing a thick red border around a photo of a person increased how attractive a stranger perceived the person in the photo. In other words, all it takes to make the opposite sex think you're more attractive is to put on some red. The theories for why we feel more attraction to those wearing red vary wildly, but some psychologists suggest it's due to the fact that humans often flush red when they're sexually aroused or interested. Perhaps the first lesson we can take away is that when you're building any type of campaign that involves romance or sex, red is the color of choice because it pops out to the eye, contrast, and because it stimulates an association. But, more, but a more important lesson here is that when it comes to color and attention, you have to consider both whether a color stands out amongst its current situations and what mental associations we have with that color. Let's dive deeper into contrast and how we can leverage color contrasts to unconsciously direct attention. Contrast. Albino animals don't survive long in the wild. In 2010, Canadian user experience UX designer Dan McGrady started CareLogger, a pet project to make it easy for diabetics to track their health. The project was bootstrapped, so maximizing signups was key for CareLogger to become sustainable. McGrady, like all good UX designers, tested every little detail of his landing pages through A-B testing, a methodology for testing the impact of small changes to a website or app by randomly giving different users either the current design or the new design to see which has better conversation or engagement. In one fascinating A-B experiment, McGrady tested only the color of his sign-up button. One button was green and the other was red. Both buttons were placed on a light gray background. Did something as simple as color affect the attention of potential customers? The answer was a resounding yes. The red button converted 34% more signups than the green button. The outcome was eye-popping. This result won't surprise user experience and user interface designers. They're profoundly aware of the impact a single color change can have on one user. Market optimization firm Wild Wider Funnel once worked with enterprise giant SAP to improve its pay-per-click advertising conversion rate for its software trial download landing page. Imagine that sentence in any other century than this. <laughs> SAP wanted to improve conversations by 20%. Wider Funnel made a series of changes to the software site's landing page, including the addition of a giant orange Download Now button, which boosted conversions by 32.5%. Wider Funnel likes to call this button B-O-B, Bob, the big orange button. Most website designers will tell you that when you want, want someone to click a button, it should be red, orange, or yellow, one of the warm colors. If you need to direct your audience's attention to a specific button, 
link, or icon using bright colors to strongly contrast a key item with the rest of the page is always the wise course of action. The reason why this worked has to do with our natural psych physiology. Dr. Peter Koenig, a German professor of neurobiopsychology at the University of, Osnes of Osnabrück, was curious about how humans visually process color features and, more importantly, what factors make a color distinctive to the human eye, especially when it comes to natural scenes. Previous research had indicated that color saturation, the vividness of a color, was the best indicator for predicting which objects we fixate our attention on, but Koenig and his team of researchers wanted to go a step further. They wondered which color contrasts attract attention the most. Over the course of three experiments, Koenig and his team showed subjects a series of unaltered photographs of the Ugandan rainforest, along with photographs in which various colors were either removed or manipulated. The scenes had no man-made objects, just berries, leaves, trees, and other scenes from the Kabale forest. In the first experiment, three types of photos were presented to subjects, unaltered, photos with red and green removed, and photos with the blue and yellow removed. Subjects in the second experiment were shown 12 different scenes with different color hues. The final experiment tested the original images from the first experiment, but with the colors altered, and with subjects who had partial color blindness. The researchers used eye tracking software to measure the level of attentiveness of each subject and to track where their visual attention shifted. The results are hard to dispute especially when you actually see the photos with your own eyes. One photo with prominent red berries hanging from a bush, for example, became even more vivid when blue and yellow colors were removed. In the photo with the red and green colors removed, however, it's completely impossible to spot the berries, and it's incredibly difficult to distinguish any discerning features in the photograph. The experiments confirmed this effect. Saturation and contrast were higher with images missing blue and yellow hues. Red was easier to distinguish, making it easier for participants to spot important items like the berries. Participants fixated, participants fixated on the same locations far more often with images lacking blue and yellow than they did with images lacking red and green, or even the original images. Even partially colorblind subjects showed a greater tendency to fixate on the same points when the images lacked blue and yellow. Being red-green colorblind didn't stop them from spotting important information like berries. Color contrast is how our brain finds and attends to relevant stimuli. In the wild, life-giving red berries stand out against the green of grasses and forests. If leaves were naturally purple instead of green, then red would be a terrible color for capturing attention. This also explains why red, yellow, and orange website buttons stand out. They contrast better against the white and gray backgrounds that make up the vast majority of websites. All you need to do to confirm this is open up a product page on Amazon.com, known for its optimization techniques, and find the yellow Add to Cart and orange Buy Now with One Click buttons. Animals, of course, have jived with the attention-grabbing power of color contrast for centuries. The cuttlefish has the unique capability of mimicking the complex color patterns of its surroundings, despite the fact that it's completely colorblind. It's nearly impossible to spot one on the sea floor, because it will not just turn brown, but sandy brown. Brown, complete with different shades of brown to mimic different grains of sand. When a hunter, or when an animal, or a hunter in the woods, for that matter, wants to go unnoticed, it utilizes camouflage to blend in with its surroundings color being the main feature. On the other hand, when Pope Francis released two pure white peace doves from his window, they were immediately attacked by a hooded crow and a yellow-legged gull, an event some called a bad omen. In reality, the doves stand out against backgrounds of brown and green, and most every other color the ground or buildings around them might be, making them easy prey. In general, albino animals don't survive as long in the wild because they stick out like a sore thumb in their natural environments. So what do you need to do if you want to capture the attention by utilizing color? The answer is to pick the right contrast. If you want to capture attention for your product, create packaging with colors that pop out against the colors of the products you're likely to be stocked next to. Everyone else is blue, go with orange. 
If you want people to notice you in a bar, wear bright colors that contrast with the typical dark lighting of most bars. Red is your friend in these situations. If you want people to pay attention to you at a professional conference, try refraining from wearing a powder blue colored shirt. From my experience, it's the color all finance people wear under their suit. If you want to get people to buy your stuff, pick a color that is the opposite of your website's background color. In one of its many client case studies, optimization firm Unbounce charged or changed a dark blue add to cart button on a gray background to bright green, not orange or yellow, as an experiment for a large European retailer. The result, the bright green add to cart button, which anybody would say pops out on the page, improved conversions by an incredible 35.81%. If you want something that's to stand out, find the one item you want people to focus their attention on and give it the most prominent contrast of color. In most cases, bright colors with high saturation and warm tones will do the job. There are great online tools for checking color contrasts if you don't trust your eyes. Das Plankton's contrast tool not only lets you visually see the contrast of various color combinations, but it also tests for color deficiencies and lets you know that a contrast ratio, a measure of how much contrast there is, of the colors you're testing. WebAIM has a simpler tool for checking the contrast ratio of two, of two different colors and whether they pass or fail the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Of course, contrast is just one element to consider when it comes to color. After all, you can't wear orange or bright green everywhere. You're going to eventually piss people off or wear them out. And the reason for that leads us to the powerful and unconscious associations we have with color. Associations, the difference between the red pill and the blue pill. Whenever I can, I like to fly Virgin America. It's among the most enjoyable experiences available in the skies. For me, though, it isn't about the onboard entertainment or the Wi-Fi that sells me. Lots of airlines have those. It's the purple mood lighting that envelops the cabin that I love most. Mood lighting isn't just something that makes you feel good. It's something that can literally save your life. In Nara, Japan, a few hundred miles west of Tokyo, the local officials were looking for a solution to a growing crime problem. Nara's city officials had a plan, though. After hearing about the impact which blue lights had at crime spots in Glasgow, Scotland, the city installed a series of blue lights at their hotspots and train stations. The result was a 9% drop in crime, but more astounding was that suicides at Nara's train stations completely ceased. Between 2006 and 2008, zero people committed suicide under the blue light. There isn't one single reason why blue lighting stops crime and reduces suicides. Several studies since the 1970s have found that subjects exposed to red and yellow scored high on the state trait anxiety inventory, a, psych a psychological test to measure a subject's anxiety, but scored far lower when exposed to blue or green. Another study found that narrow bandwidth blue light proved effective at treating seasonal affective disorder. Another theory states that blue, a color commonly associated with police and law enforcement, may also serve as an unconscious deterrent to crime. Across cultures, though, blue is the color of calm. NARA's blue light experiment demonstrates the profound effect that color has on our psyche, but how do we apply this knowledge to effectively capture other people's attention? Should we be coloring our offices blue? The answer to that question isn't as simple as choosing the right color contrast. You also have to consider the associations a color has with your audience, or you may end up capturing the wrong kind of attention. Take red, for example. While red's association with romance and sex is common across cultures, red um, um, across most cultures, red also symbolizes purity in India good luck in China, and death or vitality in certain parts of Africa. And while green reminds Westerners of nature and tranquility, it represents exorcism and infidelity in China. Seriously, don't use the color green for your product packaging in China. With all that said, there are some general rules for using color that apply universally. We already talked about the first a little, that blue is the color of calm. In a study published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, General, 
Patricia Valdez and UCLA's Albert Mar- Marabian, Marabian, sorry, found that blue, blue-green, green, purple-blue, red-purple, and purple were perceived as the most pleasant colors of color combinations, while green-yellow and yellow were rated as the least pleasant. The results were highly consistent, and the relationship between colors and their emotional reactions were highly predictable. The second general rule is that if you want to increase excitement, stimulation, or arousal, warm colors are the tools you should use. Scientists at the University of Amsterdam found that a patient's reaction to a drug, even even a placebo, was affected by just the color of the drug. Red, yellow, and orange pills had more stimulating effects, while green and blue pills had a more sedative effect on patients. The mere perception of a drug varied by its color, and that was enough to influence its effect on the body. If you want to make your friends feel more energetic, you might want to expose them to more red and orange. You see this kind of color cueing all the time in nature. The golden poison frog stands out clearly from its muddy surroundings. It lives in damp rainforests, but predators know that its bright yellow skin is a warning to avoid it at all costs. After all, ingesting just one milligram of its poison will not only kill you, but it will also take out a dozen of your friends as well. Color associations don't just affect our moods. They also affect our perceptions of a brand. So considering what each color means to the average person is vital when you're making artwork, advertising, or websites. In a study published in the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science, researchers found that a person's assessment of the likability, familiarity, and sincerity of a brand dramatically varied by simply manipulating the color of a fictional logo. The study found the following positive correlations between colors and brand associations. Each color list is ordered from strongest to weakest positive correlation. Sincerity, white, pink, and yellow. Orange is the least sincere color. Excitement, red, orange, and black. Black, or sorry, brown had the largest negative correlation. Competence, blue and red. I was surprised to learn that yellow had the strongest negative correlation with competence. Sophistication, black, purple, and pink. Orange was the least sophisticated color. And ruggedness, it correlates to brown. The correlation is off the charts. On the other hand, purple had the largest negative correlation, followed by yellow. It's important to note that this particular study consisted of students who primarily identified as Americans. 71% identified with American culture, 16% identified with Asian cultures, and 13% identified with other cultures. The most attention-grabbing colors, at least mentally, can vary from culture to culture. You have to not only pick attention-grabbing colors, but find ones that match your audience as well. How do you pick the right colors, though? While there is no surefire solution, David McCandle's book, Information is Beautiful, has one of the most complete charts mapping the correlations between colors and their emotional associations across cultures. It's the best color correlation chart I've been able to find, and it serves as a great reference. I've embedded his chart, a link to his book, in a simple color correlation tool at captivology.com color. Finally, it isn't just the color that matters when it comes to leveraging the automaticity trigger to capture attention. The brightness and saturation matter as well. The Valdez Morabian Emotion Color Study also found that increases in color saturation correlated with an increase in arousal and dominance, emotions like anger. Increases in brightness, on the other hand, correlated with increases in pleasure and sharp decreases in dominance. And the Academy of Marketing Science study came to be a similar conclusion. High saturation increased a brand's perceived excitement, competence, and ruggedness, but was negatively correlated with sophistication and sincerity. If you want to capture people's attention by making them experience the feeling of control and dominance, then use colors with high saturation, whether it's in the packaging of your products, in the clothes you're wearing, or in the promotional collateral that you design for your next campaign. If it's in the clothes you're wearing, I suggest this when you try to persuade your boss to green light one of your ideas. If you want to capture their attention by increasing their sense of pleasure, then increase the color brightness of any color cue you use. 
When it comes to color, contrast is the best tool for capturing attention, but considering the way your audience will respond to the saturation and brightness of color is critical too. Colors aren't the only visual cues that matter when it comes to attention, though. Other visual cues have the power to simplify a complicated message through the power of association. What did a symbol make us care about Heartbleed? Software bugs aren't inherently interesting to the general public. They are often technical, and all the user has to do is wait for the developers to issue an update with the fix. Very few of them really deserve your attention. But a vulnerability in OpenSSL, the open source protocol that provides security for the sensitive communication of information between your browser and the servers of Facebook, Google, Yahoo, and many of the largest websites of the world, is different. Researchers at Google, at Google and cybersecurity firm Codenomicon found such a bug in OpenSSL. It allowed a developer with basic software knowledge to read the memory of a server through an extension of OpenSSL that sends pings between a browser and a server during a secure connection, also known as the heartbeat extension, to keep that connection alive. Theoretically, a hacker could use the bug to retrieve user passwords, credit card numbers, and even a server's private keys. Worse yet, the bug had been hiding in the OpenSSL code since early 2012. People needed to know about the bug so they could change their passwords and website owners could update their servers to a bug-free version of SSL. Otherwise, the consequences could have been catastrophic. The bug's official name, CVE-2014-0160, isn't exactly memorable. So, Codenomicon did something unique. It gave the open SSL bug its own branding. This involved three things, a name, a symbol, and a website. One of the engineers dubbed it Heartbleed, referencing the leak in the Heartbeat extension, and quickly created a simple, symmetrical, blood-red heart with five blood drips coming from its base. The accompanying site, heartbleed.com, was filled with a straightforward Q&A on the bug, how it worked, and why it was a serious threat to internet security. This huge vulnerability needed a striking mark, Codenomicon's Lena Snydate, who designed the logo, told Fast Company. The color choice was immediate, deep blood red. When the bug was publicly announced, the news spread everywhere. The logo, red, simple, distinctive, and symmetrical, was embedded on almost every major news site and blog in the world. Within a week, thousands of sites had patched the Heartbleed bug, and millions received the warning that they needed to change their passwords. Not since the infamous Y2K problem, problem had a software bug captured the attention of the public so vividly and quickly. Symbols are another visual cue, much like color, that capture our immediate attention. They captivate us through the associations we have with those symbols, unlike color, which relies more on contrast. One study conducted by researchers at Duke University and the University of Waterloo demonstrates this phenomenon. The researchers briefly showed one group of subjects the iconic Apple logo, and another group IBM's blue striped logo. The researchers then asked the subjects to come up with as many possible uses they could for a brick and write them down. Even brief exposure to the logos had a major impact on creativity. Subjects exposed to the Apple logo were able to come up with significantly more uses, up to 33% more on average, for a common brick than the people who saw the IBM logo, even after a short break between seeing the logos and doing the brick brainstorm. In a follow-up experiment in the same study, the researchers exposed subjects to the Disney Channel logo and the Entertainment Channel logo, you know, the E with the exclamation point, and then administered a social norms test. Exposure to the Disney Channel logo, which was rated by pilot test participants as an honest and sincere logo, increased the number of honest responses. It's surprising on one level that these associations had an impact on behavior, but what's even more surprising is that subjects were making these associations subconsciously. This is known as the priming effect. In his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, famed psychologist Daniel Kahneman explains that our brain is an associative machine, 
that attaches meanings and associations unconsciously to different words, ideas, images, and even colors. If I were to make you read a paragraph about aging, balding, and the state of Florida, you might find yourself walking slower and more gingerly, Kahneman argues. If you're a reader of books like Blink, then you already know that there are a lot of unconscious influences that affect our thinking and behavior. We know that Apple is creative, Red is romantic and dangerous, and Florida is filled with old people. Sorry, Florid or Floridians. Symbols pull several of these associative machines into one place. There are two ways to grab attention with symbols. The first is to harness pre-existing associations. In the case of Heartbleed, a deep red logo dripping with blood screams, Danger! You need to pay attention to this bug, and does so better than any blog post ever could have. Our associations with red and dripping blood fill in the blanks automatically. Our deep-seated associations with popular symbols is also the reason why you shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to web or mobile design. The play button, the camera icon, the red notification bubble, we've already learned these associations through the use of hundreds of web products. Trying to be clever by creating your own symbols can backfire when people are expecting a video to start playing when they click a sideways triangle. The second method for capturing attention through the power of symbols is to develop new associations through consistency and branding. The Apple logo didn't stand for creativity and great design, but it gained that, asso that association through years of subtle branding and successful product launches. Building long-term brand loyalty and positive associations is a subject we'll cover in the chapter on the acknowledgement trigger. But suffice it to say, there is no shortcut to great branding. There is, however, a shortcut to getting people to like you, and that leads us to how to use touch, the most intimate and personal sensory cue of them all, to capture people's attention. Why you should always buy someone copy or coffee. OCD super genius Sheldon Cooper isn't known for his empathy in the hit CBS show, The Big Bang Theory. But he does know that when someone's upset, you offer him or her a hot beverage. Consider this dialogue. Sheldon, did you offer him a hot beverage? Leonard, no. Sheldon, Leonard, social protocol states that when a friend is upset, you offer them a hot, a hot beverage, such as tea. Howard, he does sound nice. Sheldon, you heard the man, Leonard, and while you're at it, I'm upset that we have an unannounced house guest, so make me Coco. End of dialogue. It may just seem like a common courtesy, after all, grabbing coffee with friends is a time-tested ritual, but Sheldon may actually have a scientific reason for offering hot beverages to his distressed guest, because researchers have shown that simply holding a hot object can generate positive feelings about others. A study published in Science asked 41 students to fill out a personality impression questionnaire regarding a hypothetical person. They had to rate the person on 10 personality traits. Before entering the room to fill out the questionnaire, though, someone would meet the students, complete with two textbooks, a clipboard, and a cup of coffee, and ask them to hold his or her coffee, or his or her cup of coffee, up the elevator to the testing room. Unbeknownst to the students, some of the cups were hot and some were cold. The result was astounding. Students who held the hot cup of coffee rated the hypothetical person as having a significantly warmer personality than the ones who held the cold cup of coffee. The study was performed a second time with 53 students, but instead of coffee, the researchers gave icy hot packs to the participants to hold as a product evaluation. Afterward, they were given the option of receiving a Snapple or a $1 gift certificate for ice cream as a thank you for participation. The $1 gift was framed as a way to treat a friend, while the Snapple was framed as a personal reward. The students who held the cold pack chose the Snapple 75% of the time, but the majority of students who held the warm pack chose the gift for a friend, the $1 certificate, at a rate of 54%. Another recent study published in the Journal of Evolutionary Psychology came to the same conclusion. Holding a warm object brings up our emotional feelings of warmth, leading to positive attention and more cooperation. As this story demonstrates, touch can be an important, tense, an important sensory cue 
when it comes to grabbing people's attention. Just as a warm object brings up our emotional feelings of warmth, leading to positive attention, pain can demand our attention and bring up strong negative reactions. Chris Eccleston. Really? All right. Chris Eccleston, the director for the Center of Pain Research at the University of Bath and Geert Krombenz of the University of Ghent, have researched the link between pain and attention for most of their careers. In their model for pain and attention, Eccleston and Crombe found that the pain is an inescapable fact of life. Pain will emerge over other demands for attention. The reason we pay attention to pain is the same reason we pay attention to the sound of a gunshot, a bright yellow sign, or deep red blood. We're primed to avoid pain for survival. That's why pain redirects our attention, even if it's only for a brief moment. Burn your tongue on hot coffee, and your lovely coffee chat quickly gets sidelined. This is why it can be torture for people with chronic pain to concentrate on complex problems. The more attention demanding the task, the more likely pain is to punch a hole in their concentration. The key to capturing attention with touch is to hone in on the positive associations that come with touch. It's especially useful for building intimacy, trust, and connection with somebody. A fascinating study conducted by Judy Bergoon of the University of Arizona found that the sensation of touch correlated with composure, intimacy, trust, informality, and equality. The type of touch subjects experienced mattered too. Face touching and hand holding created more intimacy and formality, or, or an informality, while handshakes conveyed the most trust of any type of physical sensation. Another study found that eye contact and mutual touch between randomly paired strangers of opposite genders correlated with elevated heart rates and increased desire. Touch grows attention by creating intimacy. Of course, social context means everything. It's appropriate to hold hands on a date, but not with a stranger you meet in line at Costco. The reason is simple. Because touch is intimate, it cannot be forced upon someone. It has to be mutual. Use other sensory cues like color and sound to capture attention. Reserve touch for when it's appropriate to build deeper attention and intimacy. So if you're going on a sales call and want to ensure a buyer's attention, bring them a hot cup of coffee. If you are out with friends and want to get the attention of someone you know, touch them on the shoulder. And be careful with cues like touching the face, holding hands, or touching the thigh. This requires a very high level of comfort between both parties to already exist. So far, we've uncovered how you can use the automaticity trigger to capture attention through sight, color and symbols, and touch. But we have one last sensory cue that is vital to our attentional systems, sound. Why can we hear our names in a crowded room? In many self-defense classes, instructors teach their students, especially women, not to yell help or rape when they're under attack. Instead, women should scream fire, to catch the attention of anybody nearby. I know I've heard this advice multiple times, and I, I was curious, is the advice sound? And if so, why do whistles and fires catch our attention more than yelling for help in a dangerous situation? Kate McCauley, a 20-something travel blogger, would say the answer to the first question is yes. McCauley was once leaving her Boston gym at 10 p.m. with a spring in her step and her headphones securely in her ears. Reminder, never wear headphones when walking in a city late at night. As she turned to go home from Charles Gate East, a hooded attacker grabbed her from behind and wrestled her to the ground and tried to pry her iPhone from her hand. She screamed fire and bit him before he took off with her iPhone. People quickly came to her aid, including a girl who came over just to see if she was curious about the fire. The problem with help is that it can mean anything from I'm under attack to I'm lost or I locked my keys in my car. In addition, some people don't want to risk themselves if there is actually an attack in progress. A fire, on the other hand, is a very specific situation that won't threaten you with a knife or a gun, so people are less likely to think they'll be hurt if they help. We encounter literally thousands of sounds on a daily basis, and most of them don't even register a blip on our radar. So why does screaming fire break that barrier, even if we're concentrating on something completely different when we hear someone scream that word? 
our brain reacts automatically to two types of auditory stimuli. Unexpected novel sounds, like a loud firecracker on a quiet summer day, and salient semantic sounds, like somebody calling out our name. Screaming fire, because it's both unexpected and salient, would qualify as both. In fact, the middle frontal cortex and the middle and superior temporal cortices of the brain immediately activate when someone says your name. Even the brains of sedated infants respond automatically when they hear their name. It doesn't matter whether you are concentrating on another task, these two types of sounds will find a way to redirect your attention, if only for a brief moment. Loud sound or unique frequencies, like most people's least favorite of nails screeching down a chalkboard, capture our attention because they stand out from the other sounds around us, often warning of danger. Other sounds, such as a name, a police siren, or the first notes of our favorite song, stand out because of the mental associations we have with each of those sounds. This is contrast and association at work. The reason unexpected sounds and salient words or noises capture our attention has to do with the fundamental purpose of our auditory system. According to Dr. Michael Posner, an expert in human attention, auditory attention is strongly linked to maintaining our alertness. Unlike visual cues, colors and symbols, auditory attention serves as the 360 degree detection system to the information and threats around us. If a car is squealing its tires and racing toward you while you're crossing the street, it's your auditory alert system that warns you to run like hell. The fact that we are always processing the sounds around us makes auditory attention fundamentally different from the other kinds of attention. For example, you will not only hear your name when someone calls it out, whether you want to or not, but you automatically attempt to pinpoint its location. Even when we are in a noisy room, we have the ability to identify a single noise or conversation in space and tune in. Our ability to focus on a single conversation in a noisy room is a well-known phenomenon called the cocktail party effect. In the 1950s, British cognitive scientist Dr. Edward Cholin Cherry, the man who first discovered the effect, found that subjects had little to no difficulty rejecting unwanted speech when attempting to hone in on a specific conversation. In his widely cited study, Terry had a group of subjects wear headphones that simultaneously played two different messages from the same voice. In the first experiment, both voices played through both sides of the headphones, while in the second experiment, one voice was fed to each ear separately. The task, subjects had to concentrate on just one message, speak it aloud, and write down that target message. Cherry found that subjects could eventually discern a target message when two messages were played in both ears at the same time, though it became nearly impossible when one of the messages was filled with illogical gibberish. But in the second experiment, with one message in each ear, subjects could easily hone in on the target message and tune out the other. This is much like a cocktail party, where we, not, where we use not only the frequency of somebody's voice, but also its location to quickly tune in. Cherry also found that pretty much all the speech occurring in the unattended ear went unnoticed. Subjects didn't even recognize when the unattended message changed from English to German. We're very, very good at focus when we want or need to be, often at the expense of everything around us. Subsequent experiments by Princeton's Dr. Anne Treisman revealed that we indeed ignore sounds in one ear and listen to speech in the other though our brain will automatically remember certain sounds even if we're not directing our attention in any way toward those sounds. For example, if someone says your name, your attention will shift even if you weren't paying attention to the person who said your name at the time. It's a, person, it's a process known as attenuation theory. But even so, you're likely to miss most of the story if you don't direct your attention to that source. In another experiment published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, learning, memory, and cognition, m researchers found that just one-third of all test subjects recalled hearing their names if they were really intently listening to something else. When you use the automaticity trigger, you have to consider your audience's preconceptions about certain sounds in addition to the sound's distinctiveness and contrast. Unexpected sounds capture our attention best, but we also need to have a positive association with them. 
The shrill of the Vuvuzela horn was certainly unexpected for Americans and Europeans when watching the 2010 World Cup, and so it captured attention. Then again, I don't know a single person who enjoys that sound and would treat you kindly if you walked into a room playing one. But if I walked into a party and heard someone playing a harp, I would both notice and appreciate it. Where does this leave us? What sounds are inherently attention-grabbing? The answer, the real answer, is that it depends on what you're doing and what you consider important or salient. In the case of the German army in World War II, that was the sound of tanks and artillery. How artists helped win a war. Brest, France. It's August 1944, a few days after D-Day. Allied forces are closing in on France's westernmost port city. Hitler's forces control Brest. It's one of the epicenters for Germany's U-boat operation. The Allies need to take the city in order to bring more supplies to troops in the European theater. But it is a well-fortified position. The Germans are not going to give up the city without a fierce fight. Luckily, the Allies have thousands of troops, tanks, and artillery surrounding the city. The German Wehrmacht unit defending Brest can hear the sound of artillery fire, tank engines, and Allied officers shouting orders. They can see the light of artillery and mortar fire, and troops. The more than 35,000 soldiers, led by General Gerhard Ramke, decide to hold their positions in counterfire instead of risking an attack against the Allies. What Ramke and the Germans don't know is that they aren't actually firing on an Allied army. The sound of tanks and moving soldiers isn't real. Neither is the artillery fire. That effect is from flash canisters being set off by the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, a top-secret unit composed of artists, fashion designers, and some of the most creative enlisted soldiers at the disposal of the Allies. The 23rd, better known today as the Ghost Army, were masters at diverting attention. Their clever and highly detailed deceptions fooled not only German forces, but were even convincing enough to confuse friendlies too. By mid-September, the town of Brest fell into Allied control, thanks in part to the efforts of the Ghost Army. The Ghost Army had just around 1,100 men from four companies, but time and time again, the 23rd fooled Hitler's forces into thinking that it was a far more formidable force. Flash canisters, inflatable tanks and planes, spoof radio messages, and dummy parachute drops were their weapons of choice. When the Allies crossed the Rhine in 1945, the Ghost Army faked a crossing to divert attention away from the 9th Army. With 600 inflatable tanks and artillery, the 23rd successfully drew Axis fire, leading to a decisive victory for the 9th Army with limited casualties. Their efforts in the last years of the war remained a closely guarded secret until half a century later, when their contributions to the war were declassified. Thanks to their captivating tactics, they were able to save countless lives. Why was the Ghost Army so successful in accomplishing its feats of deception? Well, the 23rd certainly wasn't the first to utilize misdirection on the battlefield, but its efforts are among the most effective diversions in military history. I'd, I'd argue that their success in capturing the enemy's position really boils down to contrast and association. There's no denying that German troops saw and heard the Ghost Army, who moved over 30 trucks with massive loudspeakers that could be heard 15 miles away, and whose flash canisters lit up the night sky. But just in case, some of the actors would stumble into bars and loudly discuss their orders. Seeing and hearing the soldiers stumble around certainly grabbed the German army's attention. Whew. However, it was the intricacy of the deception that made it believable. The sonic unit of the Ghost Army, an eight-man operation, painstakingly prepared the recordings that played to the Germans with every sound an opposing army would expect to hear. They didn't just record the sounds of troops' movements. They also recorded every sequence of bridge-building operations, tanks starting and stopping, trucks on dirt roads and highways, and soldiers as they started and stopped, chatted and marched. The sonic unit then mixed these sounds into soundscapes, thematic sound scenes appropriate for each situation. Different soundscapes were played when troops were on the move, when troops were resting, and for multiple situations for the theater of war. The visual component of the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops 
was just as elaborate. While a lieutenant commanded the unit, he would sometimes wear the stars and decorations of a general, just to add to the description that this was a large unit approaching the Germans. During the Ghost Army's final operation on the Rhine, the troops mixed real tanks with their intricately painted fake ones and camouflaged them well enough to fool German reconnaissance planes. They gave the Germans exactly what they were looking for, or more specifically, what they were primed to pay attention to. Imagine if you were a German soldier on the move to the next battle. What sounds are going to, ca to catch your attention? You can only imagine how salient the sound of tanks or the sight of parachuting troops would be for soldiers, generals, and recon officers. The Ghost Army successfully caught immediate attention with salient sounds and held it through short and long attention. Moving beyond immediate attention. My goal in this chapter has been to highlight the impressive automaticity with which our senses process the world around us and direct our attention, long before we're even conscious or aware of them. The subconscious influences that color, sound, touch, and other sensory experiences have on our attention are necessary mechanisms for survival. This influence happens automatically before we, or our audience, have a chance to think. That's why the automaticity trigger, our tendency to pay attention to certain sensory cues because of their contrast or the unconscious associations we have with those cues, is so good at capturing our attention or interrupting our concentration. Certain stimuli become more attention-grabbing in the right context. We will pay attention to a lion before an antelope. We will pay attention to a gunshot over the chirps of robins. We will usually look at red before blue, especially if romance or sex is involved. We cannot deny that danger, lust, and pain capture our attention, but they don't control it or maintain it. To truly capture, maintain, and grow attention, you have to enter somebody's consciousness. You not only have to capture someone's immediate attention and elicit a reaction, but you also have to capture someone's short attention and make him or her focus on you, your idea, and your message. The rest of the captivation triggers deal with short and long attention, the two types of attention that operate at a conscious level. The framing trigger is the first of the triggers that help us move from capturing someone's immediate attention to capturing their short and long-term attention. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.